Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, today I will uh, tell you a little about Python from a C++ programmer's perspective and, and why it's cool, even for me. And um, before I go right into it, I just want to show you what I will talk about. Um, first of all, I will give you a short motivation why Python is cool, even for C++ users. Then I will tell you how to embed a C Python uh, interpreter. I will tell you how to interact with uh, Python code from C++, and I will give a few hints on what you can do to improve the user experience, so to say, to include batteries. And then I will uh, finally come to the end of my talk with a short summary. Okay, so Blue Yonder is uh, a data-driven company. We do predictions for, for clients and uh, do automated decision-making. And for this, we have developed an in-house prediction platform and um, at the core, it's a distributed task scheduling system, which also handles a few other things, for example, access to data sources, uh, such as databases and uh, key value stores. Um, we've designed it for reliable 24-7 uh, operations, and it's written in C++. And uh, while our platform simplifies and reduces many chores for uh, model developers, it's actually not a real help for model development because C++ is, is a statically typed language and iteration cycles tend to be pretty slow and uh, library support is not that good as somewhere else. So uh, we looked beyond C++ and uh, basically immediately found Python. And uh, Python is a thriving community with great libraries and toolkits such as scikit-learn, which basically gives us machine learning algorithms for free and also provides a framework for putting our own uh, algorithms in there. Python can also be quite efficient by the use of uh, optimized libraries such as NumPy and, and, and Pandas. And the core language of, of Python provides us with a quick feedback loop. You can just open your Python interpreter or an IPython notebook and just tag about and, and see what happens. So the solution we opted for was to embed Python in, in C++ to somehow combine the worlds we already have, so the safe, reliable operations from our C++ application together with the fast model development uh, Python allows us. And we also get the added benefit, uh, benefit that we are quick to production because there's no need to redevelop uh, the Python model in another language. Okay, so how do we go about uh, integrating the Python interpreter? And um, this is probably the hard bit of, of the talk where I start throwing C++ code at you. And um, there's a few essential C, uh, C Python reference implementation calls we need to make. And um, what you would do in Python is you would basically create a context manager class, and, and this is what I also did in, in, in C++. Um, we define a, a C++ constructor, which corresponds to the enter method you would have in a Python context manager. And you basically get just call this pi initialize x function and disable signal handling. This is uh, useful to um, gain control over the interpreter. And of course, uh, where you have an enter in, in a context manager, you also need uh, to have a destructor or an exit method. And this exit method we just call the pi finalize method of C Python. Okay, so how would you use this? It's pretty simple. You take an existing C++ program, for example, here the domain function. You just um, create an instance of this Python interpreter class. This would be similar to opening a with block in, in Python. And then you just do anything you want with the Python interpreter. So this is uh, pretty neat, but it doesn't come without caveats um, because interpreter reinitialization can be a problem that's well documented in the C Python API. So we tend to keep just one interpreter alive for the whole um, lifetime of our process. Okay, things become a little more involved when we go to a threaded environment. Um, and this is basically due to the global interpreter lock uh, the C Python uh, implementation comes with. And due to this, we have to make some, some adjustments. And uh, in the main thread, we have to make sure that the interpreter is actually aware that other threads might be using it and we have to release the global interpreter lock for other threads to acquire. And obviously, when we spawn other C++ threads, we have to make sure that any time we execute Python code, we acquire and release the global interpreter lock accordingly. 
Okay, so what do we actually have to change? This is the Python interpreter class I've showed you before in a little condensed form. And basically we have to add some operations to the constructor. First of all, we have to call pi eval in threads, which makes the Python interpreter aware that other threads might be using it. And then we have to save the, the current thread state uh, for, for later use. This is done with the pi eval save thread function. And when we save a thread state, we also have to restore it at some point. And this is done in the destructor where we call pi eval restore thread um, to make sure everything is, is, is properly matched. Okay, so this is basically the only change we have to do for the main thread. And um, for the other threads, we need another context manager. Let's call it global interpreter lock. And um, in the constructor, we call pi jill state ensure. This will basically make sure that there's a thread state for the C++ thread, the global interpreter lock is acquired and, and it does everything that's necessary for us. And in the destructor of, of this uh, class, we will release the jill state um, just to match the bracket, basically. Okay, and to use it, you would just um, go into your worker thread, which might be some function which is executed by a thread, and you just create an instance of the global interpreter lock class and uh, this will hold the jill as long as it lives and you can do anything with the Python interpreter in, in this thread. Okay, so far I've uh, explained how the actual embedding is done, but I haven't shown you yet how to interact with, uh, with the Python interpreter. And uh, for interaction we have found the boost Python C++ library most beneficial. Um, you can download it for free on, on boost.org which is uh, essentially home of a collection of mature and commercially usable open source software, which um, yeah, is, is the go-to place basically when you look for a C++ uh, feature which is not in a standard library. Okay, and Boost Python has a lot, lots of interesting feature which we use. Um, for example, it wraps lots of functions of the CPython uh, API and it wraps it for example, to, to rid C++ users of manual lifetime management of, of Python object. This is automatically done for you. What is also done for you is a type conversion between C++ and uh, Python. This is pretty convenient. It also comes with some rudimentary exception handling support and there's a few convenient features to expose Python, uh, C++ code to Python so you can use uh, C Python, uh, <laughs> sorry, C++ code in Python just by using import and, and the standard Python uh, syntax. Okay, so how could I evaluate some Python code uh, with C++? Um, the first line basically introduces BP as an abbreviation for Boost Python, much like uh, you can do with the import statement. Then I define some, some Python code, which is two times 21. And to evaluate this, we use the eval function provided by Boost Python, and what we get is a Boost Python object uh, as a result. And to do anything in C++ with this Boost Python objects, we have to convert it to some C++ data structure, for example, an integer, and this is done with, with the Boost Python extract uh, function. Okay, so CPP result would just be the integer 42, obviously. Okay, so we also have to add a little bit of error handling and um, for this it's typically common sense to, to uh, create a try catch block or try accept as you would say in Python. And um, Boost Python will throw an error already set exception anytime it encounters an error. And here's one of the weaknesses of Boost Python. Um, the exception is pretty useless. It doesn't contain stack traces or the error message or the type of the error. It basically just indicates that an error has uh, been encountered and you could do something else about it. For example, add some improved error handling. Okay, and uh, this is why I suggest that whenever you use Boost Python features, wrap it again with some, some decent error handling of your own. Okay, so that was the basics of uh, interacting with the Python interpreter. Um, now it's time to include the batteries to make uh, Python users happy. And um, I think this is probably the most important slide of my talk, besides the summary. Um, C++ developers should always think of embracing Python. 
So whenever you have a cool C++ data structure and you spend months developing it, um, try to think how you can expose this to Python. And um, there's a few defaults you should always consider. And one of the defaults is make it a list. And the other obvious default is make it a dictionary because, I mean, Python users love the dictionaries. And whenever you have more than, than just simple data, you should uh, check for existing standards in, in the Python community. Um, for example, when, when you expose something which is range-like, um, then use the standard iterator interface. When you have a database connection and you want to pass it somehow to, to Python for performance reasons or, or whatsoever, take a look at the Python DB API. There's, there's a pep for it, I think. And uh, try to make it look like, like a real Python object. And this, this leads basically to the, to, the, to the general guideline that Python code, which you are provided by your users and you execute in your embedded environment, should never know or need to know that it is embedded. And um, I will show you an example of this. Um, and, and I call this example logging out of a box. Uh, the idea is most of you will know about Python's um, logging facility with a standard logging module. There's actually some Python code here. Uh, you just type import logging and then something like logging.warning and, and some error met message and it will be locked. So what if we could not log this, this error just to some, some logger users have to configure in Python? What if we would automatically forward all log messages to C++ and also log it to the same storage which we have configured in C++? So this would basically remove the chore to, re uh, to configure the log module both for C++ and, and for Python. And um, when, when you know a bit about the logging module, the obvious idea is to register a custom logging handler, which would do exactly this. Okay, so how would it look like? We have some CPP logger class on, on the C++ side, which provides a log function. And then we have the, the logging handler uh, class on, on the Python side, which uh, provides basically the interface for all logging. And uh, now we somehow have to bridge the gap between both worlds because it's not trivial to implement a C++ class which somehow implements a Python concept. And um, we opt for the solution which is uh, quite often the, the, the best one in, in, in computer science. We just add another layer of indirection. So on the Python side, we uh, create another class. Let's call it forward to CPP. And this forward to CPP class implements the logging handler interface. So basically it just has to provide this emit function, which is uh, about the only thing you really must provide for logging handler. And the task of this forward to CPP class is basically to, to receive records and pass it to some C++ reference, which we have stored before. And um, I will briefly show you how this looks in code. I start with the C++ part. So think about it. We have a simple CPP logger class. It exposes nothing but uh, a very trivial log method, which takes a message as a string and just prints it out to the console. So this is quite a, a stupid thing to do for logging. Um, but you can replace it with anything that's, that's more sophisticated. And now we have to expose this class to Python so that Python knows what a CPP logger is. And again, we rely on Boost Python to do exactly this. We use the uh, Boost Python class uh, template. And we basically tell it to, uh, to take the C++ class CPP logger and expose it to Python as a class of the name CPP logger as well. This uh, BP no init basically indicates that um, whenever we call the initializer of the CPP logger, it should throw an exception so that uh, Python users don't really uh, um, initialize these, this class themselves. And uh, finally, the last line indicates that uh, we want to expose the lock uh, function of, of our CPP logger class as the call method uh, of the Python class CPP logger. Okay, so once this, this code is run, Python knows exactly 
what to make of a CPP logger instance created in C++. And on the Python end, um, we have to define this, this uh, intermediate class, this forward to CPP. Uh, obviously, it needs to be derived from logging handler to satisfy all the necessary concepts. And in the initializer, we take one argument as a, as a receiver and just store it in a local variable. And uh, then we have to define the emit function just uh, to, to fill in the missing gap, which is missing from the uh, standard logging handler. And uh, the emit function will take some, some record. Uh, this will be passed to by the, by the logging framework. And uh, we just extract the message from this record and pass it to, to our receiver. Okay, and uh, so the only thing that's left to do is we have to pass this instance of our exposed C++ class to the Python class. And uh, we would have to do this in Python. So first of all, we create a C++ instance of our CPP logger class. Then we need to basically traverse through, um, through the main module, the dictionary of the main module, to finally obtain um, the forward to CPP class. <coughs> And um, the end result of this will be a boost Python object called create handler on the CPP side. And we can call this create handler function. And uh, by, create, uh, by calling create handler and passing it the C action logger, quite a lot of things happen. Um, boost Python will check uh, for the CPP logger class if it's already registered for automatic type conversion because we have uh, done what I've shown you two slides earlier, this is the case. So to translate this class to a Python object with, uh, with um, the signature, as I specified before, and uh, this object will be passed to the constructor or initializer of uh, forward to CPP, and so it will know that there is a C++, uh, C++ object living somewhere and that I can call um, the bracket operator to call it. Okay. And once I have this handler, I can just use other methods to register this handler with the logging framework. And uh, users can just use the standard logging commands, and everything they log will be forwarded to, to C++. And this is fine, because um, you don't have to configure things twice. OK, um, let me come to the end of my uh, talk. It's a short summary. And um, what I want you to take home from uh, the last couple of minutes is that embedding Python is not really that hard. We have the, the basic API calls. The API calls are well documented, so basically there's, there's no secret and no reason not to try it. Um, when you try, though, we have found that Boost Python helps. Actually, it helps a lot, even though from time to time it may be a little clumsy to use, especially when it comes to error handling. So you have to somehow add this for yourself. And I think the key message is whenever you, you embed a Python interpreter, make sure that your users of the embedded interpreter um, are still allowed to write Pythonic code. Don't force their, your C++ data structures on them, but instead adhere to, to the well-established Python standards and, and, and conventions. If you do this, your users will basically love you. And um, if you do this, most importantly of all, you still maintain an, a very important property, namely unit testability. If you can still run this, the very same code in, in your Python interpreter or your IPython module, you can just use the, the, the Python unit testing module to, to test your code. And this is something you, you uh, basically have, have to do, because otherwise all the code that is written and embedded in your interpreter will not be used uh, in the future. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, please ask them now, or just uh, visit us down at our booth, and obviously, Blue Yonder is hiring. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so uh, you said a couple of things like, uh, okay, so you, you should be using Python protocols, and um, you should embrace Python, and uh, so I'm, I'm a little surprised that you're using, so you chose to use uh, Boost Python for embedding uh, Python, and that actually has a very C++-centric view, so that sounds like a, somewhat of a contradiction to me. Um, so uh, 
you showed this this logging example, for example, which which you know goes through kind of three different pieces of code and kind of complex. So um, could you um, explain a bit why you, why you choose Boost Python instead of um, embedding something very Pythonic like like Cython? Um, okay, so um, we decided to use Boost Python mainly because um, the Boost library is heavily used in our code. Um, so there's there's lots of other modules uh, there, um, and it's been around for for quite a while. So um, we were pretty sure that that it works, and um, to be honest, it didn't prove too much of a problem so far. So I mean, f f from the perspective of, of our Python users. Um, they don't really know that they're running inside of C++. It just feels natural for them. For me as a C++ uh, developer, um, Boost Python feels naturally um, a language to program in or a library to program with. So that's, that's, I, I don't see this, this, this paradigm problem. For a C++ programmer has his C++ view, he can use that, but it still feels Pythonic for, for the Python user. I don't see the need for a C++ programmer to use more Python than is required. So, uh, first, I just want to say I, I'm glad to see more Boost Python. It's I, it's a beautiful library, and I think deeply underappreciated um, in the Python community. Um, so, I had two questions. The first is uh, first, answer the phone. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, one, I noticed you said you're in your Python and Python interpreter class. Your instructor was calling Pi finalize, but that last time I checked is actually not supposed to be done if you're using Boost Python because there's some static deinitialization issues that might occur. Are you guys not seeing any problems with PyFinalize, or is it just not an issue for you? Um, it's, it's not really an issue for us because we only do it once. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen issues when you do it multiple times, and, and, and you're right, there are some, some issues with, uh, with static things. It depends on, on, on really what you do. But so far, um, we basically have our main thread. We start the Python uh, interpreter there. And um, it's all tidied up correctly. I mean, we don't see segmentation faults when, when we quit our programs. Okay. It's, okay. That's all fine. Okay. And I guess my second, it's not really a question, I guess more of a, a pointer. There's a library called Accord. It's a C++ library, and it's designed to simplify embedding Python into C++, and it exposes a lot of things like, you know, uh, bytes or objects and bytes array objects, and, it, and the logging library, for instance, is exposed into C++. And in fact, you can create logging handler subclasses directly in C++ without any infrastructure in Python using this library. And have you guys, have you ever even heard of it? And have you used it at all? Um, actually, I haven't heard of it yet. It sounds very interesting. And I will definitely talk to you after. I'll, I'll just track you down and talk <laughs> to about it later. all the information I can get. <laughs> yeah, OK. Thanks. OK, thanks a lot. Um, could you explain a bit why you've chosen to embed Python in C++ rather than wrapping your C++ code and make it available as a Python module? Um, yeah, I, I can try to elaborate a bit. I mean, uh, I'm, I mentioned that basically we have a distributed task scheduling system. And um, our, um, let's call it legacy projects, even though they're still in development and, and stuff like this, um, they, they were already written in C++ and they had all those C++ tasks. And um, we thought about that it's, it's probably easier to embed a Python interpreter in some separate plug in to our uh, framework and actually it was easy because um, it was like done, the, the basic prototype stood in like two or three hours and uh, of course then you elaborate on it. Um, and it also gives us additional benefits, I mean we, we don't have to rewrite all our C++ code, we can use our existing um, other infrastructure which was already adapted to, to the the format of our executable to the command line parameters to the configuration we can we can pass to it, and it also allows us to to mix C++ and Python tasks. So I can I can say okay here after school optimize C++ code, it will return something and then it will automatically be converted to to the to the Python code and Python can then do some cool transformations and just return it to the next uh, C++ job and you can you can chain it without even knowing that there's Python in there. So. It seemed easier. <laughs> um, I have another remark regarding this, this question. Just um, so some, some people kind of kind of think that 
embedding is something you know something very different from from um, from extending, and so you can either provide a module or you can ex uh, um, embed Python. It's so the the only real difference is who starts the Python runtime, and from that point on, it's exactly the same thing. So there's no difference anymore because um, you have interaction between C++ and Python, and Python and C++ and you know both directions. And so it's really just, you know, who calls PyInitialize? Um, uh, who starts up the Python interpreter? Is it the person on the command line who runs it, or is it C++ code starting it? And from that point on, it's really no difference anymore. It's exactly the same uh, kind of code and behavior. And it's the same, the same thing. Thanks for the remark. Can I, can I just speak to that a little bit? 90% it, it, of what you said is true, but there are some really substantial differences between the two. One is Gil management, which he brought up, is something that Python.exe does for you, or Python and Linux, um, but then you have to actually take direct control of in, in an embedding situation. And, um, uh, you only have to take care of, oh, sorry. <laughs> you only have to take care of the Gil management as soon as you have uh, threads started by C++. Right. When yeah. you use uh, threading in, 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 in Python, um, so start it in the Python interpreter, and this is all automatically taken care of yeah. for you. This is basically just something we had to do because uh, we basically uh, handle requests in, in separate threads in our main thread. Right, right. No, I, I, I agree with you. We're saying the same thing. And I think the other substantial difference, and this, this, kind of, this is a development issue, is that PDB can't be attached to embedded Python very easily. You have to insert things. You can't start a C++ program under the control of PDB. And this is actually a strong argument in some cases for not using embedding or, in fact, taking your C++ programming, making it into an importable module, even if it's, you know, 500 megabytes. This is something you can do so that you can actually get multi-stack debugging more easily. So this is that's another substantial difference I've seen in cases where embedding has been used. Okay. Uh, so um, just quick remark on that. Uh, I buy the argument that debugging is a bit different mm -hmm. um, when you have an embedded interpreter and can't just you know go to the command line and, and stop it and do stuff. Um, threading, however, is not a difference at all because you can just run C++ threads from uh, an um, embedded uh, Python interpreter, you can just start up a C++ thread somewhere and the other way around as well. So you have a, mo a C++ module in Python and that starts up a C++ thread, so no difference there. I, I think we're all saying the same thing. The only yeah. point is that you have to manage the gill if you do that. And that's, that's the, only, the only difference. Okay. okay, thanks for all those questions. Okay, thank you also for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, an applause.